This is a sequel uh, to my earlier show, and I call it uh, Keynes and Hayek Head to Head. It, it, it's an important little exercise uh, because if you go back and read the literature of Hayek versus Keynes when they were writing articles about one another or one another's books, uh, it wasn't much of a debate. It, it, actually, it was uh, Hayek reviewing Keynes' early book, Treatise on Money, very negatively, and Keynes coming back with a, a negative review on Hayek's book. <laughs> and that didn't quite make it as a debate. So they didn't go head to head as far as I could tell. So I think we're going to do that this time. And just to give you a clue so you know what to look for, uh, ultimately we're going to Set it, we're going to set out the Keynesian framework in its simplest variety, which really is all we need to do, and then show what it takes to make it morph into the Hayekian. And by showing what it takes, then uh, it should persuade you, I hope it persuades you, that the Austrian view uh, uh, is much more worthwhile than the Keynesian. So let's get started and see what we're going to do here. There's Keynes and Hayek. Uh, Hayek was uh, junior to Keynes by about 16 years. And so uh, he was he was a little bit hesitant. Of course, Keynes had tremendous, tremendous popularity uh, at the time. And uh, Hayek was the challenger from LSE. Uh, Keynes was in Cambridge. Uh, and they battled back and forth. And so, like I said, I want to put them head to head and Turns out it's not too difficult to do. Okay, there they are. <laughs> Little known photo that we dug up there. Uh, Hayek eventually despaired over the debate. He just quit it, as did Keynes. And um, Hayek and Keynes both thought it was probably more worthwhile for them to each work on their own theory than to take pot shots at the other's theory. Uh, so, which is one reason we never got quite the head-to-head -head meeting. Now, just a, a, a brief bit of text here. Uh, <clears throat> what you're going to see is the circular flow framework. Okay, it's a, the Keynesian theory suggests one, and you've all seen the circular flow uh, in the textbooks, in which earning and spending are brought into balance by changes in the level of employment and therefore the level of income. Uh, and we'll see that the, what's called the circular flow pretty quickly uh, morphs into a uh, Keynesian cross. So we have some vertical and horizontal axes that represents the halves of the circular flow. Hayek's vision of the economy suggests a means ends framework, and that's, of course, pure Mangarian, uh, in which means of production are transformed over time, and the over time is, of course, critical as the stages of production, into consumable output. So one key difference uh, with between the Austrians and Keynes, or the Austrians and most of the any, any of the mainstream theories, is that time, namely production time, is an endogenous variable in the system. It goes in at the beginning uh, and stays in to the end. Uh, the uh, dealing with, with time of some of the other models ends up, you make the model first and then you figure out what the lag structure is by empirical determination. So uh, with the Austrians, time isn't a, an add-on at the end as a lag structure. It's simply the fact that it takes time to produce things in a capitalist economy, and the more capitalistic it is, the more time it takes. So a brief review of Keynesian circular flow framework, and here I apologize to any of you who have suffered through a, a principles course and seen the circular flow, but you'll, you'll get to see a little bit different version of it this time, so we'll, we'll see how it works. The circular flow. Uh, we have business organizations up above, and that's really just a shell. It's, it's, it's a facility that allows employers and employees to meet and allows things to happen. Uh, down below, we have all the people. We've got the workers, we've got the consumers, we've got the investors. 
that we'll meet up there at the uh, business organizations. And we'll start the circular flow here. There's part of it. Uh, and that's labor and other services. And being Keynesian about it, uh, that morphs pretty quickly into just labor. Uh, Keynesian economics is labor-based economics, almost to the exclusion of capital, except when capital getting in the way. Uh, and of course, they get paid for it. I do that right? They get paid for it. And that's called income. All right? And, well, that's half the story. If you look at the other half, uh, you get goods and services provided by the business organizations, uh, and you get expenditures by the consumers and some investors uh, to pay for the goods and services. Okay, that's the circular flow. All right. Now, I'm going to introduce a little Federal Reserve policy just to juice it up a little bit. Uh, this thing's on off. Let's put it on on. Yeah, the thing circles. It's a circular flow. So you have this circling in opposite directions, uh, the money and the real factors in, in the economy. Uh, and it's going a little slow. Well, yeah, a little slow. But no wonder, because if you look at that knob, it's turned over here to 6% interest. If we turn that down to 2% interest, pushing a lot of money into the economy, that should speed it up. There you go. See, you get speed it up a little bit. And uh, if that causes inflation, well, slow it down. All right? So that's, that's the Keynesian stick. Okay. That was Keynes. Now, here's Hayek. And, of course, his model is not a circular flow. <laughs> It's a Mingarian stages of production. And the shape of that uh, triangle changes, as we saw during the last lecture. Uh, goods move through the different stages of production. The thing can change in shape as interest rates fall and so on. So that's quite a difference between a Keynesian view of how the economy works and Hayek. So we've got a job to do to somehow morph from the circular flow to uh, the triangle. We'll see, how to, we'll see how to do it, though. In Keynesian equilibrium, of course, income equals expenditures. It just means the flow on the right half equals the flow on the left half, okay? The two flows have to be equal. I, otherwise, something's piling up. Something's happen, happening uh, in the business organization. So... Income equal expenditures, Y equals E. And uh, this is for a wholly private economy. I'm going to leave off government expenditures here because I really don't need it for this particular demonstration. And I've learned uh, when I taught uh, Auburn classes that it helped to write out wholly in wholly private economy because the Southern students thought I meant H-O-L-Y, the wholly economy. So... C equals C plus I. That's the consumption plus investment. And notice here, the C plus I, well, that's just two things added together to give you total spending. There's no suggestion here of a trade-off between the two. Okay? Now, let's convert that uh, circular flow into uh, a set of axes there. You've got expenditures on the vertical axis, income on the horizontal axis, uh, and equilibrium by definition is that 45 degree line because you want expenditures to equal income. You want what's flowing on the right to be what's flowing on the left to keep things from building up or tearing being torn down at the business level. Okay, so That's the 45 degree line. Uh, bedrock for Keynesian theory is a stable, relatively stable, and for analytical purpose, perfectly stable consumption equation that has a vertical intercept that means if you keep spending some, even though you're earning nothing, which shows you it's a short-run theory, you can't do that for long. Uh, and it has a slope of something less than one, which that's the marginal propensity to, con to consume. It means when you earn an extra 10 bucks, you spend some too, but not the whole 10 bucks. Maybe you spend eight and save two. Okay. So... 
that's a hardcore Keynesian theory. The equation C equals A plus BY, A is the vertical intercept uh, over there on the left, and Y or B, of course, is the slope of that consumption equation. And that, see, that's, that equation is not going to change. It is what it is. We'll show one instance where it does change, but generally it, it doesn't change. Now, you add on to that investment. Investment is just a given amount based to, uh, on psychological factors. Uh, Keynes called them animal spirits. Used that term three times in a page and a half, so I guess he meant it. Uh, and so the two lines are parallel just because investment is what it is and it's just piled up on top of, in, uh, of consumption. That's the way it works. Okay. So consumption and investment, as well as government spending, but we're leaving that out, are portrayed as additive components of total spending. The three components are distinguished largely in terms of their stability characteristic, not in terms of any temporal issue, uh, where C is stable, I is unstable, and G is stabilizing. That's, that's the Keynesian mindset. Okay. Uh, and here you can see plainly that income, which is measured horizontally, equals consumption plus investment. Uh, and so the economy is in equilibrium. We're going to let that be full employment equilibrium if only by happen so. Equilibrium doesn't mean full employment. It just means income equal expenditures. But if you're lucky, and you probably won't be, uh, that, still, that, that could be full employment income. And we'll see about that. Okay. So a wholly private economy achieves income expenditure equilibrium when y equals c plus i. Note that it's income itself. In other words, instead of having prices and interest rates and wages adjusting to bring it into equilibrium, it's the level of income on that horizontal axis that changes to get you in, to get you equilibrium. So the economy can spiral up to an equilibrium or spiral down to an equilibrium. And there it sets in equilibrium, even if that's not full employment. Keynes called it a, a unemployment equilibrium. Equilibrium because y equals c plus i. Unemployment because, well, that's where income had to spiral to to get that equality. Okay. Yeah, according to Keynes, it's only by accident or design that the economy is actually performing at its full employment level. And I'm going to introduce a, a labor market here. We assume here that initially full employment conditions prevail if only by accident. And let's see how we show that. Now, there's two ways to show it. One is by using our consumption versus investment. And say, there's the PPF. And then if we trace over from the level of consumption, and that turns out to be on the PPF at that, also at that level of investment, hey, you're at full employment. Okay? That's full employment. Now, Keynes didn't use that PPF. Uh, he simply looked at labor markets. So let's make a labor market here. The full employment implies that the economy is operating in it on its production possibilities frontier, the PPF itself being defined in terms of sustainable output levels of consumption and investment goods. So it's the same, I'm using that PPF the same way I did this morning, okay? What Keynes would do is, is pull down a labor market here and see what's going on. Uh, and if you look at the labor market, hey, look, you got a supply of labor, demand for labor, and it turns out that uh, we're in equilibrium. Good for us. Now, Keynes describes that a little differently. If you're a Marshallian, that is a microeconomist, uh, what you see is that there is a supply curve and there is a demand curve. And is it the case that prices have adjusted to bring them together? Well, it looks like that's the case here. Now, Keynes would, would look at that a little differently. He would say, well, there's a supply curve. And there is a wage rate. There is a wage rate. There's a supply curve and there's a wage rate. And he had a, spe a special name for that. If you're taking notes, you can write down the special name. 
It's, if I were Judge Armentano, I would make you stand up and tell me what the special name is. But the special name is, it's the going wage. The going wage. Okay? And so the question is, if you look at the supply curve and the going wage, then you want to see, well, does demand intersect at just the point that makes that full employment? And if it doesn't, you're out of equilibrium and something needs to be done about demand. That's the way Keynesian thinking. So it's, so it's supply and the wage rate that are given and uh, demand is up for grabs and can be manipulated by policy. Okay. Full employment implies that the labor market clears at the going wage rate. The going wage itself having emerged during a period in which the economy was experiencing no macro problems. So Keynes just sort of brings that in the back door without anybody noticing it. What is this going wage? Oh, that's what that, that, that's the market that worked for you and for me sometime back in the past when some for some reason, if only by accident, things were working right and you had full employment. But now if things if, if demand has changed and and the wage rate hasn't changed, then we need to fix demand. Uh Labor income is represented by y equal w times n. W is the wage rate, of course. N means number of worker hours. That's the best I can do. I don't know why economists use uh, n. They could they could use l for labor, but l usually means land in classical theory. So uh, w n, and of course that's just that uh, little rectangular patch down there, that's income of labor. But Keynes says, well, okay, that's income of labor, but it's a proxy for all income, as long as the ratio, the relationship between labor and land and capital don't change, and how could they, why should they? If they don't change, then uh, we can just measure income by labor income, multiply it by some factor, if you know what that factor is, but don't otherwise bother me about it. All right. Now let's get going here. I'm going to bring back my circular flow. According to Keynes, a collapse of investment activity, the collapse of being attributed to the waning of animal spirits, is the primary cause of economic downturns. He doesn't announce that till one of the late chapters. Uh, in the general theory, I think it's either the last chapter or the next to the last chapter. That's the primary cause. It's not monetary. It's, it's a waning of animal spirits uh, in response to reduced investment and hence reduced employment opportunities. The economy spirals downward into recession and possibly into deep depression. And here, of course, he's ignoring the interest rate effect. He hadn't got any interest rate up here yet, anyhow. So he's ignoring that effect, and it's a derived demand effect all the way down. Now, I'm sorry, I don't have an axis for animal spirits. So, <laughs> okay, well that would <laughs> that would tend to cool the heels of any investor, and so what happens is that C plus I falls. Isn't that right? Let's let it fall. There it falls. Okay. But as C plus I falls, then you have excess inventories because you get C plus I plus something else, or the something else is stuff that got produced and wasn't sold. So what you'll have is, like I say, things piling up on the business. You have excess inventories piling up at the firm level. See, up here it says E is less than Y. So people aren't buying what's being produced as measured by the income paid out to have it produced. And so we get these excess inventories. There they are there. Okay. Now, what happens then? Well, the economy spirals down. Okay. So now, watch the economy spiral down. To a new equilibrium. Uh, yeah, I see what I'm doing there. 
if you look upstairs, I want, I want to go back. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going the wrong way. But I'm going to go back to here. Uh, see, here's, here's where we can show this Keynesian relationship. You see, income fell. That's that vertical distance, a delta I. Uh, and that caused or investment fail. That caused income to fall. And there's a ratio there that's the so-called multiplier. Delta Y equals 1 over 1 minus B times delta I. That's the Keynesian multiplier. So if investment falls by 100, uh, maybe income falls by 500. Uh, and But we also notice that consumption falls. Okay, So this is the business of everything falls. It's not that investment falls relative to consumption. Investment and consumption both fall. They fall at different rates, but they both fall. All right. So the simple investment multiplier is one over one minus b. You might have seen that in uh, in your textbooks. That quantifies the relative rates of downward or up or upward spiraling. Now look at the labor market. What's happened is the demand for labor has fallen. Those people aren't investing as much. They're not hiring people. Uh, but look, the wage rate hasn't changed. Why hasn't it changed? Because it's the going wage rate. The wage rate's the going wage rate. And so demand is wrong. That's the way Keynes would put it. So note that the going wage keeps going even after the market conditions that gave rise to it are gone. Now, you never see that in the general theory. Or you don't see it in the textbooks. But when you state it that way, you say, well, something's funny about this theory. It doesn't deserve to be called a general theory. How general is it? You know, it's nuts. Uh, and and so here, see, Keynes on wage rates is a funny thing. I had to read the general theory several times before I finally figured it out. But he has three arguments about the wage rate. Uh, and it's similar to what's known as a, a lawyer's argument. Do we have lawyers in here? Oh, they're all down to Napolitano, so we can talk about lawyers. <laughs> the lawyer can argue that my client didn't borrow your lawnmower, okay? And it was already broken when, he, when you loaned it to him, okay? And it was still in perfect shape when he returned it. Okay. Now, if he can get if he can get the jury to fall for any one of those, he's got his client off. So Keynes did something similar. He argued that wages are sticky; they don't change. Okay. And he also argued it's a good thing they don't change because the wage rate is fine. What we need is more demand. All right. If he could get you to go with either one of those then he's got what he wants. Now, I could go on with this Keynesian, but I, in the name of time, uh, I'm going to skip. I think I'm going to skip. Yeah. So, morphing now from circular flow to means ends. You know, it gives me plenty of time to do that. And so I start again. I'm going to repeat this, but with an, an extension. Uh, this time... Uh, what's going on becomes more transparent if we keep that production possibility frontier in play. All right. So the PPF helps build a bridge from Keynes to Hayek. So there's the PPF, and it shows the same relationship I showed earlier. But now, let's do this thing about investment falling again. And on the left, the same thing is going to happen that happened before, so you don't need to watch that as closely as you watch the PPF. You can see, well, what happens here? And here we go. Let's see, you start off at full employment, and then let investment fall. Waning of animal spirits causes investment to fall. There it falls. Okay, now we're going to equilibrium. And what you see is the economy moves inside the PPF. You have unemployment, you're in a depression. Okay, they both fell. 
right? And again, you could look at that in terms of the labor market, all right? Now, suppose investment falls some more, further waning, down further, and it goes down again, okay? Now, what we'll notice, yeah, see, demand is way down now, and you'd think the wages would be falling, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they fall? But no, he doesn't even want them to fall. He wants to, in fact, he, he wants policies to keep the wage rate from falling. Uh, and and that's, that's another part of the lawyer's argument. In other words, he's just saying wage rates are sticky, they don't fall. And then he says, we need policy to keep them from falling. <laughs> so they would fall if you let them, but he doesn't want, and the reason he doesn't want them to fall because he thinks the problem is demand. We need more demand. All right. Now let's see what we're going to do. Yeah, if you look over here, I'm putting those points in from the PPF down to where it fell, and I'm even uh, putting one outside the PPF which would, would uh, be inflation in Keynes' view. Okay, so movements inside the frontier and beyond are traced out of that linear relationship showing how consumption varies with investment. The straight line that passes through these points is called the Keynesian demand constraint. Now, it's, I think it's worth your knowing that the the reason it's called the Keynesian demand constraint is because I named it the Keynesian demand constraint because you don't see it anywhere else. Okay. It's not in the textbooks. Uh, that's the Keynesian demand constraint. If, if you don't have enough demand, whatever the demand is, you're moving along that uh, diagram or that upward sloping curve. And note here, this is just a matter of geometry in case you're worried about does all this stuff fit together. Note that if investment were to fall to zero, the economy would settle into an income equilibrium, income expenditure equilibrium with Y equals C. And so, uh, thus that vertical intercept of the demand constraint uh, corresponds to zero investment, right? Uh, and if you do the, if you do the algebra correctly, uh, you'll get the equation of that demand constraint. Uh, I may walk through it just very briefly. That's the equilibrium condition. If you've been, how many have been in a intro macro course where you had to solve for the equilibrium level of income? You done that and solve for the equilibrium level. Of income? By God, you better get it right. Okay. Well, take those take these same equations. In other words, take C equals A plus B Y and Y equals C plus I and solve for the relationship between consumption and investment. So all you have to do is eliminate uh, the Y from the equation. And you know enough algebra to do that, and I'm not going to wade you through it, but it looks like that. And so you get C equals A over 1 minus B plus B over 1 minus B times I. And let me write it up here too. There's the intercept is A over 1 minus B, the slope is B over 1 minus B, and C equals A over 1 minus B plus B over 1 minus B times I. That's the Keynesian demand constraint. That's the equation for it. Simple equation, but you show me where else it's written. Uh, uh, and <laughs> when I published uh, Time and Money, I thought I would be the first economist actually to put that in a macro book, okay? Now, I got disappointed. Uh, and it wasn't because somebody else put it in their book first. It's because when Routledge sent me my complimentary copy of, of the book, I flipped 100 and page 136 to see my equation, and it wasn't there. There was just a blank space. It says, and so the demand constraint is in a big blank space. <laughs> it wasn't there. So I... I blew it, okay? <laughs> now, if you go to the Auburn Library and, and check out my book there, the equation is there, because I went over there and put it there, okay? <laughs> but I had to wait till the second printing to get, to get it in the book, okay? 
for simplicity, and you'll see why, what's going on here, uh, for simplicity, let A equal zero. Well, no, A doesn't equal zero, but let's let it equal zero, and let B equal 0 0.9. Then C equals A plus BY becomes C equal 0 0.91, all right? A result to which Keynes attributed great importance, and I picked those particular parameters, the zero and 0 0.9, because Keynes used them to illustrate a point, and it's worth looking at his point. Uh, let, me, let me read it and see if we can catch on here. If, for example, the public are in the habit of spending nine-tenths of their income on consumption goods, and so that is B equals 0.9, it follows that if entrepreneurs were to produce consumption goods at a cost more than nine times the cost of the investment goods they were producing, some part of their output could not be sold at a price that would cover its cost of production. Okay? Uh, and he goes on to say, the formula is, of course, not quite as simple as this. Well, no, because, because A is positive, and so you get a, a slightly different uh, equation. It's not quite so simple. But there's always a formula more or less of this kind relating the output of consumption goods, which it pays to produce, to the output of investment goods. This conclusion appears to me quite beyond dispute, yet the consequences which follow from it are at the same time unfamiliar and of the greatest possible importance. And of course, it is beyond dispute because it, it, relies, it relies on wage rates not changing, it relies on derived demand being the only thing in play uh, when uh, savings increases and so on. But that's what Keynes said. Now, let's keep track of the possible interest rates movement, the loanable funds market. And we can do that because we could put that loanable funds market downstairs there, just like we had uh, in the Austrian diagram. And we can draw the curves the same. Uh, actually, Keynes recognized that you could draw the curves the same, but uh, he said that they still didn't imply what uh, the Barshalians thought, and we'll see how this works too. Uh, so now, you notice the PPF now is a dashed line, uh, meaning that you don't move along it. It's called the PPF. The second P is for possibilities. The production possibilities frontier. Uh, at this point, it should be the PIF, possible production impossibilities frontier. You can't move along the sucker. Okay? You can only move along the demand constraint. That's Keynes. Okay? So it says, though Keynes argued that neither saving nor investment depend in any significant extent on the interest rate, he also argued that both curves, as conventionally drawn, shift together, leaving the interest rate unchanged. So he said, yeah, draw your Marshallian curves, but don't shift one and see a movement along the other. They both shift. They both shift. And they both shift at once, then change the interest rate. And we'll see how that works. Now, with the loanable funds market in play, we see a decrease. We see that decreased in investment is accompanied by a leftward shift in the demand for loanable funds. Let me back up just a minute, because that's a complicated shift. What I'm going to do is decrease investment, just like I did before. You have a weaning of the animal spirits, and investment falls, and that's going to show up in two ways. One is that that whole C plus I falls, just like it did before. But two, the demand for investment funds down here shifts left. Okay, because people aren't investing, so you have smaller demand for investment funds. Okay, so now let's do that shift. There it goes. All right? Now, if you're a market-oriented economist, you say, okay, uh, the demand for investment shifts. And so there's downward movement on the interest rate. And Keynes would stop you right there because he'd say, oh, no, 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 because before that can happen, 
something else happens. Namely, the economy crashes. <laughs> in fact, it's a, good, it's a good bet. You can generalize this in Keynesian economics. If anything happens, the economy crashes. <laughs> because he's got his parameters set up to be equilibrium parameters only in a certain constellation. And you change any, if you change any one thing, you're going to be out of equilibrium. It's either going to crash or it's going to give you inflation. Okay? It's got to go one way or the other. And so let's watch this. Let's see. With loanable funds in play, we see a decreased investment is accompanied by leftward shift in the demand for loanable funds, putting downward pressure on interest rates. But the spiraling downward of income implies that the supply of loanable funds, that's saving, also shifts. In other words, if you're not making as much income, you don't save as much. Okay, revealing, uh, relieving the downward pressure on interest rates. So when I pull the trigger now, you'll see the supply of loanable funds shift. People aren't saving as much because investment has fallen. People aren't earning as much. They can't spend as much. All right? So you're stuck in an equilibrium there. Now, here's the kicker. And I, I got this far in my development. Uh, and, and then it reminded me of a particular graph, which happens to be the only graph in the general theory. And I thought, well, that diagram in the general theory, which is kind of muddled up by Keynes, is about the same thing as the one I've got. And sure enough, let's look at it. There's the general theory. It's on page 180. And there's his graph. That, I'm sorry, it doesn't look quite like mine, but we can show how it is mine. And let me show. It's shown on page 180. Keynes presented the loanable funds market with the interest rate. He called it R. But R is on the horizontal axis. You usually don't put price on the horizontal axis, but he's got R on the horizontal axis. And what's he got on the vertical axis? Nothing. <laughs> if a student did that, I'd flunk him, you know. You can't label your axis. But if you read his script, you fail to label the axis, okay? But if you read the text, he says investment or saving is measured vertically. He should really say investment and saving because investment uh, measures the demand for loanable funds and saving measures the supply. So let's save Keynes and put saving, comma, investment on the vertical axis, uh, the interest rate on the horizontal axis. And now we all, all we have to do is flip the thing over and rotate it, and, and we've got it. the same thing I've got. Keynes diagram can be flipped over, rotate 90 degrees to make it conform to the modern renditions. Okay. So now he's got it, except he's got the squirrely things kind of sloped the wrong way in terms of, in terms of saving. Instead of being bowed out, it's bowed over or something. Well, all right, we'll, we'll make do with that. Now, some of the saving curves are intended only to demonstrate that income is a shift parameter. In other words, you save it according to how much interest you get. But certainly if you're making more money, that, sh that, that curve is at a different place than it was before. If you're making less money, that curve is at a different place. So the supply of loanable funds will shift with changes in income. So let's eliminate the ones where he's just showing it's a shift graph. And those are the ones. Okay? Now, look what we've got left. We've got an equilibrium interest rate there, and both curves shifted. In fact, this is his point. This is his very point. When demand shifts to the left because of waning of the animal spirits, sh supply shifts to the left too in such a way that the interest rate doesn't change. Well, that's exactly, that's identically what I've shown in that bottom diagram on my PowerPoint, okay? And in fact, you can show that same thing over on his. You just have to stare at it and study it a little bit more to see, yeah, 
I haven't changed anything in the process. I've simply flipped it around and eliminated the irrelevant parts of the curve. So, so we're right on track. In other words, that particular diagram shows that I'm being absolutely 100% true to Keynes in his general theory. That's one of the first, the first uh, charges that are made against the Austrian theory. Oh, you don't understand the general theory. You don't understand what he means. Well, we do understand what he means. That's exactly it, and that's what we're incorporating. So that's that's what it's all about. Okay. Now let me back up here. Yeah, I'm doing okay time wise. Keynes also denied that the increase in saving would have an effect imagined by the loanable funds theorists. Keynes' paradox of thrift, and we've seen it before in simpler form. Uh, as articulated by the general theory, is to the point. And here's what Keynes says. Every attempt to save more by reducing consumption, how else do you save, will also affect incomes that the attempt necessarily defeats itself. Okay? So saving is self-defeating. So don't save. Just don't do it. Okay? It'll screw up the economy. Put us in a depression. Now let's see how that works. And now you really have to look at a lot because when I change, when I increase saving, that's going to lower the consumption equation. The equation that we said a while ago doesn't change. Well, Keynes says it doesn't change, and it's a good thing it doesn't change. If it did change, then you'd have this paradox of thrift problem every time people decided to save more. But let's work with the instance where people do decide to save more. And so that consumption equation is going to go downward. But when it goes downward, so is C plus I, simply because I is sitting on top of C. So C and C plus I will go downward. And at the same time, savings will go rightward. People are saving more. Okay? So let's watch that. There they go. Okay. Now, the one thing I didn't mention, and I'm going to show this one more time, is that that demand constraint is just as stable as that consumption equation. So if the consumption equation doesn't move, then that demand constraint is just like it is. But if we're allowing the consumption to fall, then that demand constraint will fall too. And so, when I pull that trigger, you see it fall too. Okay? Like so. And then you see where the... Yeah, see, we've got the right intercept. Okay, there's the economy crashing. And now we see the economy is inside the frontier. Keynes was right, if his model was right. Uh, so we've got a, a depression, and we've got I haven't shown the labor market there. Hence the paradox of thrift. Try to save more, and you'll instead learn less. And then there's the labor complement. In other words, now the demand for investment funds has fallen, and so we've got unemployment. All right. So this, this was Keynes' tirade against saving. Just don't do it. To resolve Keynes' paradox of thrift requires only that we replace the Keynesian cross that reflects the economy circular flow with the Hayekian triangle, which depicts the means and ends in a temporal sequence. So this is the morphing. The morphing is about to begin now. So let's reset this thing. There it is. And I want to introduce that uh, structure of production. So I recognize that that's consumption, isn't it? We're sitting here at full employment income, just happens to be full employment income, and we see how much consumption is. But instead of measuring it like Keynes does, let's bring in our structure of production and get rid of the Keynesian cross. Okay? Got that done. 
Keynes, however, assumed a fixed structure of industry. And this is, this is in his uh, chapter two, uh, which has a very innocuous title. Uh, it's called The Choice of Units. That's chapter two, The Choice of Units. Uh, and in it, he makes some simplifying assumptions. And, and he says we, we assume a fixed structure of industry. Which means essentially the triangle didn't change. It's a fixed structure of production. So, okay, put the structure of production in if you want, but it's fixed. Read chapter two. Keynes is about how the economy works if that structure can't change, if it's fixed. Right? So we'll stick with Keynes for the time being. Um, the only live issue then is the triangle size. It can get smaller, bigger, but it's structured. Uh, doesn't change. All right. Now, we began as before with the economy functioning at full employment. The labor market is represented is representative of each of the stages of production that make up the economy structure. So if it's fixed, then there's, there's no difference in how labor operates uh, among whatever stages there are. Okay. So when I look at the at the labor market, that applies to everything along that uh, time dimension, and it's just the labor market, no differentiation. Okay, so the market mechanism is still the Keynesian mechanism is still in play here. They're the mechanisms of Keynes. So once again, in accordance with the paradox, an increase in saving causes the economy to spiral down into a less than full level of employment. All right? So here we go. We've got an increase in saving. The income constraint fell. And now watch the reaction. Okay. So what we see is that you get a smaller triangle, but not a differently shaped triangle, because the shape is fixed. So you got unemployment all the way down the line. It's as if the derived demand effect worked unabated all the way down. Never mind that uh, the early stages are interest rate sensitive. Okay, and of course you've got unemployment. There it is. Note that the sole effect of the structure of production comes from the initial reduction in consumption. The derived demand effect works undiminished on all the earlier stages. The interest rate is effectively out of play. The leftward shift of the saving took the downward pressure off of interest rates. And in any case, the capital structure is assumed to be fixed. Again, does this deserve to be called a general theory? It's called the theory of an economy in a straitjacket. <laughs> so we need to take it out of the straitjacket. So here we are. Now, let's say three modifications are needed to transform the Keynesian vision into the Hayekian vision. And I want you to look at these three changes. And you tell me if there's any basis whatsoever that you can think of to object to making those changes. Right? Let's look at the first one. Divide the structure of production into stages. Is everybody for it? It's easy to do. There's early stage and so on. That's easy to do. What else? Avow the stage specific labor markets in which wage rates adjust to changes in market conditions. Okay, Here we just got one labor market. So let's re-outfit the labor market. Okay, and still I just do two stages, don't have enough room to do five. So now we've got some variation here. And and if you if you think about this, now this structure of production can change now, and those labor markets work differentially, and that's what moves you along the frontier. That's what moves you along the frontier. And so that uh, 
demand constraint is no longer in play. And the only question is, how do we get rid of that? Watch. Okay, gone. And, there's, and the frontier now is a solid line, meaning you can move it along. Okay? And so now, if we get an increase in saving, the paradox of thrift becomes a gateway to growth. Hey, okay, it's a little hyperbole. <laughs> gateway to growth, but you get it. With wage rates and interest rates both adjusting to changing market conditions, the economy can move along the PPF, and the structure of production can adjust to an increase in savings. All right? Of course, you've seen this before because it's just the Austrian model. <laughs> Okay, new equilibrium, adjust to saving, no unemployment, and the economy stays on track. Uh, in one of the early articles, Hayek made this summary point uh, in a little different context, but it certainly applies here. Mr. Keynes' aggregates conceal the most fundamental mechanisms of change. It's when we disaggregate stages and we disaggregate labor markets and we allow wages to change, and we allow interest rate to change uh, in, in, re in response to a change in saving. You allow that, and the economy will work. Okay. So we've done our morphing. <laughs> okay, thank you much. Okay. Actually, we have time. I'm surprised we have time for a few questions. Uh, if anybody has them. Yeah. I always wondered, um, while, while doing it over on 101, I always wondered how it became the predominant view. Uh, how, how is it you know, feasible that things when you uh, that's an interesting question. The question, that, in case somebody didn't hear it, how did how did Keynesianism become the predominant view? Uh, and part of it was was because of the mesmerizing influence of John Maynard Keynes. I mean, he was a hero, uh, going back to the Treaty of Versailles, uh, and a well known figure and statesman and so on. Uh, and so uh, people were inclined to get along with Keynes. And uh, one, one of the things that's sort of ironic is that occasionally you hear the Austrian economists referred to as a cult. Well, if there was ever a cult, it was Keynes and his little band. Because not only did he lamb blast Hayek, but he had all of his people writing nasty reviews. See, uh, Piero Strafa, the worst one, uh, reviews of, of Hayek's work. But, but probably more important than that, is that Keynes won out because of politics. It was the old don't just stand there, do something situation where, and that's the same today, that uh, if the economy goes in the toilet for whatever reason, then the government is expected to act and act quickly and act decisively. And Keynes had the recipe. You spend more money. Uh, you go in deeper in debt. Okay, you... You have public works. And Hayek was saying that uh, if you ever get out of this depression, I can show you how not to get in another one. Well, that didn't quite do it politically, okay? And if you have trouble understanding uh, how Keynes prevailed, Keynesian policy prevailed, it would be the same trouble you have understanding how Obama policies prevail, okay? Uh now, in the Great Depression, we had Roosevelt making policy, and one of his policies was killing pigs. Are you all aware of this? He, he, he was trying to keep up the price of pork because hog farmers weren't making enough income. So he orchestrated the killing of pigs. And I'm not talking about a dozen pigs. I'm talking about millions of pigs. He killed, I think, 8 million. Killed 8 million pigs. And the hog farmers loved it because he paid he paid them for the pigs. 
And the pigs were just rotting on the ground. They weren't used for anything. A very bad policy. But people loved Roosevelt because he was doing something. And the pig farmers really loved Roosevelt because they got to sell their pigs to the government. <laughs> uh, now, in modern times, we don't kill pigs. We crush cars. Okay, you remember the cash for clunkers program? That we got to get this economy going. Let's destroy some assets. Let's destroy some cars. That ought to get it going. Really? Okay. Uh, and yet, uh, you had tremendous support. And, and the program was, was judged to be very, very popular. And it was popular with people who could sell their clunkers, you know, for above market prices. Uh, and some people were just in the spirit. They, they thought this was great, uh, the crushing of cars. There was one newspaper report of an individual that came in with a, about a 12-year-old Mercedes. It was in very good shape. The guy always kept in the garage. And he wanted a new car, and this was his clunker. And they said, well, that's, that's not a clunker, boy. You know, we'll, we'll take that. We'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you double the amount of money that we could give you for ca cash for clunkers. And he said, no, I want mine crushed. <laughs> he was with the program. <laughs> okay. So people don't know much about economics, certainly not much about macroeconomics. And they don't always go the right way. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, you've been a good audience. Thank you.